Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Mackey and you're watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. Twice per month I host a show about pediatric health topics where we take and answer your questions live. Today we're talking about scoliosis in children and teens. Scoliosis is when there's a curve and sometimes a rotation of the spine and it occurs in about 3% of adolescents. Joining us for this discussion today is Dr. A. Noel Larson, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. She has special interest in the treatment of scoliosis in children and teens and is using new surgical technology to do so. Dr. Larson has been leading research on scoliosis, including being the director of pediatric orthopedic research at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. And she is also a member of many research groups, including Setting Scoliosis Straight and the HARMS Study Group. She's also a fellow of the Scoliosis Research Society, and we are so honored to have her here today. It's gonna to be a great discussion, so please send in your questions under the Facebook Live video feed. We will try our best to review them during the live broadcast today. So Dr. Larson, thank you so much for coming back again and talking about a really important topic that I think sometimes doesn't get as much information that people should be receiving. Well, I'm really pleased to yeah. be here, Angela, and I think um, there's been some very exciting developments that we'll get into in the second half of our yeah. visit. And then every um, opportunity in clinic, I see children that potentially might have missed a treatment window or the family wishes it had been diagnosed sooner. Mm -hmm. So it's really a pleasure to, to come here and, and talk uh, to families directly yes. about scoliosis and, and how to um, go through treatment if need be. Absolutely. So remember to send in your questions today if you have specific questions about your child mm -hmm. um, or just scoliosis in general because we want to be able to address those with you. Mm -hmm. So let's start off by just defining what is scoliosis and Specifically, do we know what causes it? We don't know what okay. causes scoliosis. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes children with certain neurologic conditions um, or um, certain histories like chest wall surgery as a small child, that is a, a risk factor for mm -hmm. developing scoliosis long, later on. But the most common form of scoliosis is called idiopathic scoliosis, meaning we don't know what causes it. It's mm -hmm. idiopathic. Um, and in that type of scoliosis, it does seem to run in the family. So mm -hmm. oftentimes there's a family history, but I'd say 80% of the time there is no family history. Um, there's quite a few groups that are working on the genetics of scoliosis okay. um, to try and figure out what specific genes cause it, but likely it is multiple genes, um, and that makes the work a little bit harder mm -hmm. for our medical genetics colleagues. Um, Absolutely. There's some interesting data that children with scoliosis have lower bone mineral density mm -hmm. um, and lower vitamin D levels. If we get a DEXA scan, which is like a fancy study to look at how strong the bones are, um, some Sometimes that score is lower in people with scoliosis. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping uh, in 10 years from now we'll be able to bring back more to you mm -hmm. um, about the causes for scoliosis. But we, we still call the most common form of scoliosis idiopathic, mm -hmm. and we don't know for sure what causes it. Okay. I think we have a diagram or two to show us kind of visually what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and can you explain to us what this is here? Well, one theory about scoliosis, and just to define it again, it's a side-to-side -side curve of the spine, um, and it happens in growing children. Um, and it can get rapidly worse during the teenage growth spurt. Um, and nowadays, that teenage growth spurt sometimes is hitting girls at age 9 or 10. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really kind of that pubertal growth spurt where the body goes through a lot of changes. Um, but um, one theory about scoliosis is that the vertebra in the spine, instead of growing symmetrically, because there's a little growth plate above and below each vertebra, instead of the vertebra growing symmetrically, the vertebra um, starts to curve a little bit. And growth plates, which are squished grow mm -hmm. more slowly and growth plates which are being pulled apart grow more quickly mm -hmm. and so the vertebra gets a little bit wedged and a little bit more wedged and a little bit more wedged and we call it like the vicious cycle mm -hmm. um, if we go back to our slide um, again you can see that that vertebra is being w loaded um, unevenly and the curve gets worse and this is actually a patient of mine um, whose curve um, within nine months went from being pretty mild there on the left hand side to now being um, pretty severe so so there is a window where we really want to catch the scoliosis if possible and because there's lots of great treatment options available. Mm -hmm. So what should families be looking for and what should I be looking for as a primary care provider? For sure, for mm -hmm. sure. So I think very basic but I think it's very reasonable to have in clinic to have the patient undress. Mm -hmm. And we don't always do this in this mm -hmm. day and age, but if you undress the patient, you're much more likely to see something. Um, so just inspecting and looking at a child's back, you might see one shoulder higher than the other. And again, you could do this for your own child if they'll let you look at their back. <laughs> Sometimes summertime is better because yes. the children are wearing you know, fewer clothes in the summertime. Mm -hmm. In the winter, um, children tend to get 
again, teenage-like, and they wear fewer clothes, and they're covered up, and they don't want someone looking at their back. But you can look for the shoulders to be even. Sometimes you'll see one shoulder blade sticking out. Mm -hmm. um, look for asymmetry. And then the classic test is called the Adams forward bend. Mm -hmm. So you have the child lean over, touch their toes, and you just make sure that both sides of the back are even. Um, and oftentimes it's hard to see. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see. It is hard um, to see. It's a challenge, I think, in primary care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They used to do a lot of screening back in the schools, and that's something that I think a lot of people have gone away from. Tell us about that. Yeah, there was a big effort actually led in Minnesota to make every state um, have school screening be part of their um, curriculum. Mm -hmm. And even here in Rochester and Olmstead County, we had a full-time public health nurse that went out and screened all the children at every school in Rochester um, you know, a couple times um, Mm -hmm. each year um, and the it was it wasn't all the children but it was at certain ages in mm -hmm. middle school um, depending on boys or girls what age but mm -hmm. um, but it's been hard you know there, there's a lot of um, um, burden of proof now where we have to prove that the screening actually does things mm -hmm. and uh, we've worked with the US preventative uh, services task force and as we've seen for breast screen breast cancer screening or prostate cancer screening they want to really show that the screening saves lives mm -hmm. and they want to really show that scoliosis treatment makes um, people better later in life and, and that's hard to prove mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately um, a lot of the school screening has gone by the wayside mm -hmm. uh, but I think it'd be worthwhile mm -hmm. maybe 10 years ago there was a lot of discussion well did some of the treatments work, mm -hmm. bracing treatment in particular. We didn't know for sure that bracing has worked. Uh, but in the interim, there's been some really good studies that show bracing does change uh, the chances of needing surgery. Braces reduces the risk of surgery. Brace keeps the curve um, lower. So I think um, I'd like to see more school screening done. And I do ask pediatricians and primary mm -hmm. care doctors um, to try to remember to screen. Mm -hmm. I, I know there's a lot of things to do in a pediatrics it's visit. Yeah, yeah, it's mm -hmm. important. It should definitely be part of mm -hmm. the well-child visits for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, um, when do you screen children for scoliosis? I, I start screening as soon as they can stand up. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. so at every well child visit, as, as soon as they're, you know, probably 12 months to 15 months, I just try and do a forward bend test with them mm -hmm. at the age, so I'm looking for that asymmetry. Right, yeah. right. And I think that's actually mm -hmm. really important, what we might talk about a little bit later, but sometimes we do see scoliosis in babies. Yeah. It's much less common as opposed to maybe mm -hmm. one in 300 patients that need treatment. It's more like one in 10,000 or mm -hmm. one in 20,000. But interestingly, in the babies with scoliosis, it's usually grandma that notices. Really? Grandma or grandpa. I mean, someone that has had some baby yeah. experience yeah. Um, and is used to looking at the baby naked in the bathtub. Yeah. Um, and um, so I agree, screen yeah. everyone all the time. It really shouldn't yeah. take too much time. So let's talk about the different types of it. And I think we have a diagram here oh, yeah, showing perfect. a younger, a younger good. kid about Sounds that. So good. you said there's the infantile or infantile, younger. Infantile. Um, so we used to have infantile, mm -hmm. juvenile, and adolescent. Right. And then we kind of changed um, everyone under 10, mm -hmm. renamed it early onset scoliosis. Mm -hmm. So if you have scoliosis under age 10, um, and again, this is, uh, I'll try not to talk too much about the Cobb angle, but that is kind of our metric for yeah. how bad is scoliosis. Um, and, but under age 10, we think long term, it can cause problems with breathing. These are the curves that can get to be, um, I think there's a picture of a baby um, that we can put up. Um, under age 10, yeah, there we go. Under age 10, again, Look at this little baby. Like you can't hardly see her scoliosis, mm -hmm. right? This is the this is the baby on the left, and that's wow. her curve on the right. So, so they hide it, right? Mm -hmm. They hide it. Um, and um, so under age ten, it can be a real problem because you imagine if you have that big of a curve when you're right. one year old, and then you continue to have ten to fifteen degrees worsening. I mean, I, I have a couple patients, you know, that have hundred, hundred twenty degree curves because this was caught a little bit later. Um, but um, many of the children with under age 10 have other medical problems too. Mm -hmm. They might have um, a neuromuscular condition like spina bifida or cerebral palsy. Um, so far we've been talking mainly about idiopathic scoliosis, mm -hmm. but the neuromuscular forms can be more difficult to treat and can be, um, you know, I guess more, more malignant. So, um, yeah. So we talked about, you know, doing the forward bed test. So what if... What, what are the next steps in the treatment and the diagnosis process? And, For sure. And, and maybe pulling back up. Um, this is that, a good one, actually. Yeah, that is. So, again, if we're worried about scoliosis, there's really two things we do to make the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. One is seeing something on exam. We'll pretty much always see something on exam as far as one side of the chest wall being different than the other or one shoulder being higher. And, or the Adams forward bend, again, where one side of the chest is higher. Um, and then an x-ray. 
an x-ray is really kind of definitive. So, so these mild curves, like way on the left, that's not even really scoliosis. This middle one um, on the second over, 10 to 20 degrees, that kind of patient we'd recommend if they're growing to mm -hmm. come back in and continue to monitor it. Because again, the curves can change a lot in a year with growth. And then the children in that second to last column with the moderate curves, those patients can benefit from bracing. Um, and uh, bracing has now been shown by a prospective, randomized, level one, highest quality evidence study that bracing is better than no bracing. So, so I think um, bracing is a great option Option if the child is growing and is able to wear a brace. Mm -hmm. I, I think you and I have both have shared some patients mm -hmm. that don't um, uh, aren't able to wear a brace. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if your child can't wear the brace and they're getting depressed or they're having pain or they can't handle it, um, you know, we can treat scoliosis. Mm -hmm. So so don't ruin your life over wearing a brace. That being said, I have yeah. many, many patients that wear braces and have had a very successful outcome um, through wearing the brace. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it's an option that should be offered to children who are eligible. How long um, do they typically wear these like each day and how, how many months or years do they need to wear them to see a benefit? For sure. The, the study I was talking about was done out of Iowa City with mm -hmm. Dr. Weinstein and Lori Dolan. And they had 25 children, 25 sites throughout the U.S. and they randomized children to the brace versus no brace. Mm -hmm. And they stopped the study early because they found that it was um, not fair to withhold bracing from children. So it was pretty strong data. Mm -hmm. um, and um, interestingly, in that study, some people only wore the brace six hours a day. And even at six hours a day, there was a treatment benefit. Wow, that's um, incredible. In general, like historically, yeah. um, you go to see the orthotist, they hand out the brace, and they tell people 22 hours a day in right, brace. Right, right. Which is very hard. Yes, it's very not hard. practical for a teenager going through everything the, that they do. The mm -hmm. other interesting thing is more and more we're adding monitors to the braces. So we're adding like a little um, chip that we can query and it'll hold six months of temperature data. So you come back in to see me <laughs> and we plug in your brace to the computer. Big brother. And it is. And, and we always ask families, yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. have to yes, do this. Yeah, absolutely. But it is kind of fun. Yeah. And we print well, out the report. Well, it's help the data and research too. Well, to you know can tell. Much. Like this is yeah. where they went to summer camp. And yep. this is when, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is when I was uh, visiting my friends on the weekend. And you can help, help troubleshoot, mm -hmm. you know, well, we need to wear the brace mm -hmm. more. Um, after school or mm -hmm. before school or something like that. But, but at any rate, those brace monitors have really helped us to determine that even less than prescribed amount of brace wear is still very helpful. So even if you can get 12 or 16 hours a day and it's still probably doing something. That's fantastic. In an ideal yeah. world, yeah. the more brace wear, the better. Yeah. Um, the important things with the brace is that um, it's comfortable and they're not getting sores and the child mm -hmm. is able to wear it. I mean, you can build the best brace in the world that gets the spine as straight as possible, but if you can't wear it, it's not not useful right mm -hmm. um, the other big uh, consideration is that an x-ray in the brace shows curve correction um, the x-ray okay. in the brace should look mm -hmm. better than the x-ray out of the brace okay. um, because going back to that little vicious cycle mm -hmm. the idea of the brace is we're pushing on the spine to hold it straighter to help the growth plates grow more evenly mm -hmm. and we see some remarkable results um, if we go back to that baby slide, I mean, you can see that that was actually casting. So it, we don't do this for teenagers, but mm -hmm. little babies will put in a body cast and, and we can grow the spine straighter. Mm -hmm. um, I, oftentimes in teenagers, we're shooting for just holding the brace, um, holding the curve steady and yeah. avoiding progression. But What about other options? Sometimes um, physical therapy is something that's mentioned. Is that right. beneficial? That has been something mm -hmm. else that has changed since okay. the last time we spoke yes, with you. Yes, definitely was surprised um, to me. In, in Europe, um, historically, um, when you were diagnosed with scoliosis, you were given the brace. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition, you were sent to physical therapy three or four days a week. So many big centers in Europe mm -hmm. and Poland, Barcelona, Spain, mm -hmm. part of the national health care system mm -hmm. is that you go to therapy three or four days a week for your scoliosis. And in general, I'd say that the bracing outcomes from Europe seem to be a little bit better than the bracing in the U.S. And I don't know if that's because children in mm -hmm. Europe are more compliant and <laughs> able to wear their braces more. Or is it the physical right. therapy right. where children are getting um, training as to how to hold their spine straighter? Mm -hmm. um, or is it the community? Because if you go in and spend three or four afternoons a week with other children that have scoliosis mm -hmm. and a therapist who cares about you, mm -hmm. does that help you wear your brace more too? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of confounding variables there. But I think historically, yeah. all the scoliosis treatment, which historically has just been bracing and surgery, it's things that the doctor does to the patient, right? right? And, and therapy is something you can do you can for do yourself. yourself right. And um, as far as what type of therapy, um, 
The main interest in our field right now has been scoliosis-specific exercises, or Schroth Physical Therapy is one school. There's several different mm-hmm. schools, but again, we call it scoliosis-specific exercises, and they're asymmetric therapy. So instead of just mm-hmm. strengthening muscles on both sides of the back, mm-hmm. you're trying to make one side stronger than the other. And and I've seen mm-hmm. I've seen some really remarkable results. That's, that's incredible. It's not probably yeah. for everyone. Yeah. I mean, we're talking two and a half hours a week of doing therapy. It's a big commitment. Yeah. Big commitment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, I think it's out there for the children who. Um, are interested in it and a lot of the big scoliosis centers around the u.s now have therapists that work with children that's fantastic yeah okay so we've got for the the lower degree of curvature we've got braces and physical right, therapy right what about those more severe curves for sure yeah. and, and just to emphasize yeah. out there if your child has a little mild scoliosis many 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 of these curves don't progress mm-hmm. um, and particularly once the child is done growing we think if your curve is less than 35 degrees the child is done growing you have a great future we wouldn't recommend surgery, um, maybe do some therapy yeah. if you're interested in some right. type of treatment. Right. Um, so the larger curves are less common, mm-hmm. um, but um, the concern with a really large curve over 50 degrees is it can continue to get worse throughout your whole life. And um, curves over 70 degrees can cause breathing problems where um, potentially on a pulmonary function test in the lab, mm-hmm. um, there's alterations in your breathing. Um, children under age 10 with large curves, that, that might, be life-threatening. Over age 10, we don't think scoliosis really in the modern era is life-threatening, even if you have a really large mm-hmm. curve. So, um, But a lot of people develop pain. Um, the asymmetry in the back can be cosmetically displeasing, or mm-hmm. people have poor self-image. Not always, but some people do. Mm-hmm. Um, so for larger curves, there's a variety of surgical options out there. Um, fusion surgery has been around since the 1970s. We have lots and lots of mm-hmm. data on fusion surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, and fusion surgery has been very successful for the most part. Okay. Um, I think we have a picture yeah. of fusion surgery. There's the picture. Um, and so this is a child that had a larger curve. Um, we make an incision over the back. We move the muscles out of the way. We put screws and rods in the back. Um, and then we actually um, set up a fusion, which is asking those bones over the back to heal into a solid sheet of bone. Wow, okay. So it's very durable. Yeah, how do you decide if you would consider the surgery versus uh, some of the other forms? Um, well, for fusion, um, it's tried and true. Mm-hmm. Um, it um, There are certain curve patterns that fusion really is mm-hmm. the only option for. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, again, fusion we don't usually offer to children below age 10. Mm-hmm. Um, under 10, uh, the children are still growing, and we yeah. want to try some other strategies to preserve growth. So one of the x-rays you showed earlier was a, a Cobb angle um, yeah, that we use. But, right. But something else you look at is how much bone potential and growth they have left. For sure. Can you sure. Um, can we pull up the, the picture of the Cobb angle and you can talk a little bit more about that. And does that come into factor when you're considering whether they're going to do spinal fusion, what like rise or stage they're at, or versus one of the other less yeah, invasive? Yeah, well, we think, um, we think the Cobb angle over 50 surgery is indicated. Mm-hmm. Um, as I've been in my practice now 10 years, and I've met different families and different people, um, I've kind of opened that up. So I say between 40 and 60, I think fusion surgery is very reasonable. Mm-hmm. Over 60 degrees, I'm kind of pushing for fusion. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a medical problem okay. later in life. If the child is growing yeah. um, or has significant back pain or really doesn't like the way they look, mm-hmm. I mean, fusion at 40 might be reasonable too. Okay. Um, now, we are going to, I think, dive into some of these other topics, and I'll just add there's several new non-fusion options mm-hmm. out there. Um, until this August, um, they weren't approved by the FDA. There's very little long-term data on the new options. Um, Fusion patients do pretty well, but particularly if you need a fusion down into your lower back. Um, I brought some little props. But if you need a fusion into your lower back, your lower back is what does the bending and the twisting and the lifting. Um, So here, I'll just show, here's a normal spine. Here's a normal normal spine here. Um, And I have kind of a model here as well. But here's a normal spine. And your thoracic spine doesn't really move that much because it's connected to your rib cage. And then your lower back, this is what does your bending, your twisting, your lifting. And normally you have six discs there. Um, And these discs work hard. Think of all the lifting and bending and twisting Mm -hmm. you've done in your life, right? Yep. Um, And when people get back pain later, later in life, it's usually due to problems in these discs and these joints. Um, So depending on where your curve is, if your curve's in your lower back, um, fusion surgery um, can limit your motion. Um, And um, so this child probably had curve in their lower back. We have rods and screws. 
to do the fusion, we take out the little joints that are in the back and we put the rods and screws in and the lower back doesn't move as much. And I think over 40, 50 years, we worry that these mm -hmm. discs can wear out more quickly. Mm -hmm. My patients that have had a fusion like this, yeah. I mean, they're happy that their curve is under control, that their cosmetic appearance of the back is better, their pain mm -hmm. is often better, but they're a little stiffer right. in the fusion of the lower back. Okay. Upper back fusion, like the x-ray we showed, yeah. that's not so bad. People, um, and in general, people are cleared to return to all sports mm -hmm. after fusion, yeah. um, but you may have to learn how to do your sport a little bit differently if you have a big, long fusion. So, What's the recovery like after a fusion? I'm usually in the hospital three to five days, and um, a narcotic pain medication for a week or two. Um, going back to school, typically once you're off the narcotics, so okay. around three weeks. And how long till they can return to sports? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I well, bet that's one of the most common exactly. questions you get. Yeah. For sure, at six months, children can go back to doing everything. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the sport and how low the fusion goes. Okay. Yeah, so sometimes at three months. Okay. Yeah. So the newer options, which we're all excited to talk about, but mm -hmm. I have to like have a lot of caveats, right? Yes. And exactly. then I'm going to apologize too. There's kind of two brands or two companies that have things approved. So if I mention the name of the company, that's just because there's no generic available mm -hmm. at this time point. Yeah. Um, but um, the tethering surgery has been around um, for the last eight, 10 years. Um, and a device was approved in August. Um, this is a totally different approach. So, so instead of an incision in the back part of the spine, um, we're doing incisions. Hey, look, there's a picture of the little portals. So you see there's like mm -hmm. little two centimeter incisions in the chest. Um, we put the screws in on the side of the spine. And instead of having um, um, a solid metal rod, we have a plastic cord. Hmm. And the spine still bends and twists and moves. Um, and then we're also having the cord function as an internal brace. So we're only offering this surgery for children who are still growing because that internal brace is going to coax the spine to grow straighter. Um, and what we want to see is the child finishes off their growth, the spine grows straighter. Are there any alterations that you have to do after it's initially placed, or is it once it's in, it's, well, that, that's it? Well, higher revision yeah. rate, I'd say. So okay. higher chance of needing a second surgery. The fusion mm -hmm. is about a 5% chance of a second surgery within okay. two years. The tether, I'm saying 10 to 15% chance you'll need a second surgery within two years. Okay. So so um, it's not as predictable. Yeah. Instead of a nice solid yeah. cord, we have a plastic yeah. cord. Yeah, why don't you show us on your model here? Yeah, I'll show here. your model here. So I have, um, I have a plastic cord. Um, so here's the cord, yeah, and that's literally uh, the cord. It looks like a, like a clothesline. A, mm -hmm. Looks yeah. like something I have in my house. Yeah, it looks like something you have in your house. It's really um, cool. But it is uh, approved by the FDA for this purpose at this point. Wow, it's incredible. called a humanitarian device exemption. Okay. So only a certain number can be used each year, and only at certain centers that have uh, a research approval or an investigation. Or, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, humanitarian device exemption approval. Mm -hmm. So, and um, you you are putting these in. We are. We've yes. been placing mm -hmm. these since 2015, and it's been um, um, it's been a nice journey. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we've learned a lot in our technique. Um, for the right family, it's a really nice option as opposed to a fusion surgery. But mm -hmm. I think people have to understand there's more risks mm -hmm. as far as needing a second surgery. Um, the, the curve can go too far the other way. So the right-sided curve mm -hmm. can turn into a left-sided curve because mm -hmm. it can be very powerful. Um, the cord can break because as we looked at it, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's a nice cord, mm -hmm. but it, it's not a huge cord. Yeah. Um, and also in orthopedics, if we are putting something across uh, a joint, even if it's... Um, you know, uh, a huge metal rod. If there's motion at that joint, the body is so strong that that thing will break. So, so we were about cord breakage. We were about undercorrection. We were about overcorrection. Is the recovery any different on this one compared to the fusion? We haven't proven it, but okay. in my opinion, it's a little faster. Okay. And I guess we've done some internal audits and yeah. a little bit yeah. shorter time in the hospital. The approach looks less invasive. Um, I, is that true or not? And again, that's a hard mm -hmm. thing to mm -hmm. okay. um, approve. You know, how, yeah. how do you measure invasiveness? You, is, yeah. it, is it how long the incision right. is? Is it how long the surgery lasts? Mm -hmm. Is it the risk of the surgery? But I, I think in terms of mm -hmm. like all of surgery, the fact that we use smaller incisions, mm -hmm. that the children are moving faster, that the children need fewer narcotics, I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say it's less invasive. Are they getting back to sports any differently with the tether or is it the six same? Six to 12 weeks to okay. go back. So, so instead of three sooner. to six months, okay. I'd say kind of six to 12 weeks. At 12 weeks, we clear people to do everything in gymnastics backflips, wow. horseback riding, hockey. Oh, wow. Um, and, and that's kind of the yeah. thought. You're, you're assuming a little bit yeah. more risk mm -hmm. with the tether, but potentially um, you're getting more reward. Mm -hmm. so, so here's a case example of a child that had the tether. You'll, you'll notice with the tether, the curves are typically a little smaller. The children are a little younger. Mm -hmm. um, to get a really nice result, we really need some growth. 
Mm -hmm. We want that child to be doing a little bit of growing and having those wedged vertebra turn mm-hmm. into square vertebra again. So kind of earlier in the puberty process? If we can catch it. If we can catch right. it. Okay. And again, so early I'd say in our tether mm-hmm. experience, we were waiting for the curves to get to be 50 degrees because that's kind of our mm-hmm. classic time we recommend fusion. Um, but I've had a few children where we were at 45 and we waited and now their curves 55 and they're done growing. Mm. And I feel a little badly that maybe they, they missed a treatment window. Okay. So. Yeah, but the tether's a lot of yeah. uh, controversy. Yeah. Some people feel like we should only be doing fusions because mm-hmm. the fusion children do well too. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of discussion too, like who makes the decision what type of surgery to have? Is it the parents mm-hmm. or is it the child mm-hmm. or a combined process of the two? Right. But I, I'm all about options. Yeah. And I think when people come to see me, mm-hmm. they also feel like, well, we didn't make a decision today. And I said, well, this was an educational yeah. visit. I'm going to give you a lot of information. You go home and talk about it. Absolutely. And it's then a big give decision. Me, it's a big decision. Yeah. And then give me a call and we'll talk more because Absolutely. it takes a few days to make this kind of um, determination for your child's back. Let's talk about a couple more options. So there's yeah. another one, magnetic rods. Oh, Tell magnetic growing rods, yes. absolutely. Okay. So those have been around a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. And these are really for the children under age 10 with severe scoliosis who have failed bracing and they have failed casting if they're willing to try a body cast. Some families don't want to try a body cast. Mm-hmm. And really that body cast age is kind of under age 5. Yeah, We don't send children to school on body casts. Um, that would be miserable. Yeah, well, yeah. I think it's just socially yeah. hard. Mm-hmm. So, absolutely. Um, Typically, um, so if you have a pretty severe curve, we have not been able to control it with other measures. We don't think fusion under age 10 is safe. Um, And the tether, um, because we only have fairly large instruments and fairly large equipment, it's pretty hard to put it in a pretty small child. It doesn't come in in an extra size small, right? Yeah. (laughs) Maybe it will someday. Maybe someday. (laughs) Maybe it will, yeah. Yeah. Um, But um, so for this age group, really bad curve we can't control it it's rapidly getting worse we can do things called growing rods Mm -hmm. Um, and basically historically for growing rods we would go in and put some screws at the top screws at the bottom and do surgery twice a year and lengthen children's rods in the back twice a year through open surgery Mm -hmm. it wasn't a big surgery it was usually outpatient they went home the same day but you can imagine the stress Mm -hmm. and the infection risk so so there are now magnetically controlled growing rods where there's a magnet um, inside of the rod Mm -hmm. and in clinic we can actually hold a magnet magnetic device up to the rod and the rod will spin and lengthen in the clinic so so I can grow children yeah. two or three millimeters at a time yeah. three or four times a year um, but for sure a magnetic rod is always two surgeries one to put the rod in mm. um, we don't think um, and the company doesn't recommend that we leave these magnetic rods in for life um, just because we don't mm-hmm. know the long-term effects of having a magnet in your back mm-hmm. Um, so it's a second surgery to take them out and do a fusion. Okay. So, so it, magnetic rods a pathway yeah, to fusion. Another way. Okay. Is the success um, any different than other uh, options? Well, I think we're trying to do a difficult thing. We're okay. trying to grow the spine inside the body. Right. Um, we're trying to span, as we talked about earlier, we're trying to span joints yes. um, with a rod. Right. So, the, so the rods yeah. can break. They can get yeah. infected. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's a complication rate with mm-hmm. growing rods okay. um, but um, if that's what your child needs mm-hmm. and again in this a- under age 10 group we're really trying to help people f- avoid major medical problems later Absolutely. in life so under age 10 we think um, magnetic rods can be quite helpful okay. so Oh, we got a question. Yeah, we have an audience Yay, question coming in. So um, can a thoracic curvature, not the scoliosis, more the, the lower thoracic um, lumbar area, can that be healed too is their question. Interesting. So I think thoracic curvature, to my mind, sounds the same as scoliosis. Mm-hmm. If it's a little curve, like less than 10 degrees, or in my mind, I think maybe even less than 20 degrees, like little curves, I think that's a great role for therapy, postural training, core strengthening. Um for bigger curves, I've had mm-hmm. a few children that got better in braces, mm-hmm. um, where we started out with a 30-degree curve and they ended up with a 15-degree curve. Some of those patients were doing mm-hmm. physical therapy as well. Right. Um, but um, And then there's a whole other class we really haven't gotten into, but sometimes yeah. children will have like a it's fracture in their back yeah. or a tumor in their back mm-hmm. um, or um, sometimes a spinal cord abnormality, like a pinched spot at the base of the brainstem, like a Chiari malformation. Mm-hmm. This is a whole class we haven't really talked about. Mm-hmm. But um, some of these things, if we treat the stress fracture, if we treat the tumor, um, if we um, – 
you know, treat the underlying condition, the scoliosis goes away. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. So we're always looking for those. I think that's yeah. one reason it's important yeah. that if your child is diagnosed with scoliosis to just go see someone who specializes in it. Mm-hmm. Because occasionally we pick up children where, you know, they were on their way to getting a fusion surgery and actually they had a spinal cord tumor that we picked up or actually they had something else that, mm-hmm. that we were able to address. So I think a real thorough examination we tend to do a pretty good neurologic exam for everyone, mm-hmm. um, family history. Um, again, make sure that we're not missing a different cause for the scoliosis. Okay. Yeah. Real quick, because we're coming towards the end of our time, did you want to talk about the other uh, recently approved oh, FDA? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is really a phenomenal month for the FDA. I mean, they, <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, they approved two spine devices through a new pathway. It's called humanitarian device exemption. Mm-hmm. Um, to my knowledge, there was only one previous device, like a growing spine device, that mm-hmm. had been approved through this pathway way um, in the last 25 years Wow! Um, and so they approved two in the course of two weeks Um, so the second device um, has not been readily available in the US to date Um, it's in use in Europe and it's in use in um, uh, it was developed in Israel um, by Dr. Floman Um, and this device is a little bit um, more like a fusion surgery Um, and I think we have a picture of it that there's a screw at the top a screw at the bottom and a little hinge Mm -hmm. so that the rod can still move on the screws so you kind of see there's like mm-hmm. one point of fixation one or two points of fixation at the top one or two screws at the bottom and then there's a, a hinge in there and um, biomechanical studies have shown up to 40 percent preserved spinal motion mm. um, we're hoping it may be one of the first sites for this device but the the verdict's not quite out yet it has been approved mm-hmm. and i think the company is now selecting sites okay. at which place to offer this device the advantages of it will be less surgery than a mm-hmm. fusion Um, I'd probably still add potentially a higher reoperation rate than the fusion. Again, because we have moving parts over Mm -hmm. the spine. Yeah, And moving parts are prone to failure. Well, it's exciting that there's so much um, new research going on in this area. It's been a huge year. I mean, really, this is like a huge development in the last... 30 years. We really haven't had a, a huge um, new, two new ways to treat scoliosis that's severe. So okay. it's really, I've learned a lot that's from my fantastic. families yeah. and a lot from being involved in this, this whole field. What, what resources would you offer to your families and what do you tell them about for support groups and other things that they can, they can go get information from? For sure, for sure. Well, there's one amazing group that I actually visited um, two years ago for their national meeting in Long Island called Curvy Girls. Um, unfortunately, it's directed towards girls. Mm-hmm. They were working on a boy support, support group mm-hmm. as well. But it just was a really nice, open-ended approach that was focused on the families, focused on the children's needs, um, because everyone has a different journey through this mm-hmm. whole process, and not every journey is positive. I think we as physicians need to remember that this is a, a challenging thing, mm-hmm. and it comes at a challenging time. Yeah. Girls more than boys middle mm-hmm. school, early high school years, a lot of changes going on. So um, so yeah, the Curvy Girls are one resource. And then also I'd say speak with your um, um, primary care doctor or your orthopedist or neurosurgeon or whoever you're following with, because oftentimes there are local support groups too and local networks where families can get in touch with other families and, and mm-hmm. learn more about the condition. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all this information. We'll have you back again sometime to talk about the next updates when okay. there's even more research coming up. Hopefully we'll it. know more yeah. by then. I really appreciate it. Excellent. That's all the time we have for everyone. So thank you everyone who watched and joined in the conversation. You can catch the next Ask the Mayo Mom Facebook Live video question and answer session on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. It'll be on October 24th at 11 a.m. Central Time. We'll be talking about sports and sports injuries with two Mayo Clinic sports medicine physicians, Dr. David Soma and Dr. Luke Radel. It'll be a great discussion, so be sure to catch it. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.